peak performance, just getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. There are a bunch of old ideas about aging. One of the big ones is the idea that old dogs can't learn new tricks. So stuff you want to do in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s that really will determine the success at the tail end of your life. Anytime you see the impossible become possible, anytime you see peak human performance, you're seeing the state of consciousness. The most important of the flow's triggers is what's known as the challenge skills balance. Flow follows focus. We pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of that task slightly exceeds our skill set. So you want to mm. stretch but not snap. Flow is a sort of a focusing skill. So the more flow you get, the more flow you get. Creativity and innovation spikes in flow. We feel our best and perform our best. You get so focused on what you're doing, so focused on the task and everything else just starts. What does it take to do the impossible? What does it, what does it take to level up your game like never before? What does it take for individuals, for organizations, for even institutions to achieve paradigm shifting? Nothing is ever the same again, breakthroughs. Our mission is to decode the neurobiology of flow and cognitive peak performance. Access the minds of maverick scientists, groundbreaking innovators, and world leading experts to understand what it takes to achieve ultimate human performance. So you can feel your best, perform your best, and accomplish your boldest goals. I'm your host, Rian Doris, and together with best selling author Stephen Kotler, I present to you Flow Research Collective Radio. I've been so fascinated with your work, Stephen, and I've no I've listened to other podcasts that you've been on, and I'm really excited to dive into you know the the whole realm of human performance with you. And before we dive into your story and, and that whole world, I would love for you to give the audience some context of what the Flow Research Collective is and a little bit of a high level understanding of what the work that you do. Perfect. Uh, so I'm the executive director of the Flow Research Collective, and we study. The neurobiology, <clears throat> big word, neurobiology of peak human performance. In other words, we study what's going on in the brain and the body when people are performing at their very best. And our work is mostly focused on the state of consciousness known to researchers as flow. You may call flow by a lot of other names, runner's high, being in the zone. If you play basketball, it's being unconscious. If you're a jazz musician, you're in the pocket. The lingo is sort of endless. It refers to, technically, it's an optimal state of consciousness. We feel our best and perform our best. More specifically, it's any of those moments of rapt attention and total absorption. You get so focused on what you're doing, so focused on the task again, everything else just starts to melt away, right? Self-consciousness, sense of self diminishes, time passes strangely. Sometimes, occasionally, you get that freeze frame effect. I mean, anybody's been in a car crash, much more frequently, you just get so sucked into what you're doing that five hours go by in like five minutes. And throughout all aspects of performance, mental and physical, go through the roof. So that's at the heart of the work we do at the Play Research Collective. And essentially, we're a research and training organization. On the research side, we do the research I've just been talking about with folks at Stanford and USC and UCLA and UC Davis and on and on and on. Um, and uh, then on the training side, we take what we've learned and we use it to train folks. And we train people, tens of thousands of people every month in 130 different countries. Uh, wow. And we're data geeks. So we have like globally diverse <laughs> and, you know, wildly accurate models of what works and what doesn't. And, and the folks we train, um, it's really the whole gamut, right? Like soccer moms and dads all the way to professional athletes and members of the U.S. Special Forces. We work with a lot of companies, whole companies and uh, executive teams and things like that, Facebook, Accenture, Audi, Bain Capital, San Francisco Police Department, the Air Force. Um, Very cool. So uh, that's, I'll stop there. I think that's the, that's the <laughs> short, quick, and dirty about about what that we do. And I also incredible. write books. And, and there's um, so, so many I, avenues so we can go down. And speaking of books, about you've written, is it 13 books now? 14. Well, 14. if you count the audio book as a book, okay. it's 14. If you don't, it's wow. 13. I don't know what to do. That, that is so incredible. And, and more so, like something that I, I think would be great to just start on is, you know, your new book, NAR Country, I would love to start there, right? When it comes to bringing in these practices that you've been teaching and researching for, for so many years and applying them to yourself and going through that journey, um, I would love to, you know, give you the opportunity to one, share what this new book is and talk about it before we dive in. 
Yeah, Now Our Country is a sort of a, a, a crazy wild book, uh, my most recent book. It uh, It is two things. It is first an attempt to solve sort of this ongoing problem I've had uh, in peak performance, other people have had in peak performance, and that all of our clients seem to have, which is for reasons that we can get to if you want. Peak performance is essentially a chip. Well, first of all, let, what do we mean by peak performance? Peak performance is nothing more or less than just getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. To do that, there's a series of things you want to sort of do every day and every week, right? It's a checklist um, in a sense. There's other things going on, but it's essentially a checklist. It is really hard at somebody who's at the front end of a journey, a journey who's coming into these ideas of, oh, wow, I can actually do so much more than, than I thought. What's this about? What's this like at the front end of the journey? Two things are really difficult to understand. One, what does it look like every day? And two, how does this, these little things that you do every day add up into really big leaps, right? I always say peak performance works like compound interest. It's a little bit today, it doubles tomorrow, it doubles, it doubles, it doubles, and sooner or later, it starts to get a little exponential. That is very hard to convince people of on the front end. So one, now our country is this sort of radical experiment in both peak performance and peak performance aging, which is literally just applying the ideas uh, of peak performance to the challenges and opportunities in the second half of your life um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So people can really see what does this look like practically. And unlike my other books, which I've written about this subject, which are much denser, much more science heavy, this book mm -hmm. is application heavy. And so it's essentially an adventure story and it's much more fun. Um, if you're not, if neuroscience isn't your thing, <laughs> right? It's much more fun, which means that, you know, it's a lot easier for anybody to sort of Gain, gain the information. That's the big picture, what the subtle picture is. So there are a bunch of old ideas about aging that in the lab over the past 20 years no longer appear to be true. One of the big ones is the idea that old dogs can't learn new tricks. Mm -hmm. And so I decided in my 50s, because I'm a little out of my mind, that I was going to try to teach myself. I was going to take a bunch of these new ideas in, in what you could call peak performance aging and blend them together into a learning protocol and see if I could use that to teach myself how to park ski at age 53. And park skiing oh is goodness. the discipline in skiing that involves doing, you know, tricks off jumps and on rails and boxes of water. It's wildly yep. acrobatic. It's dangerous. And for about 12 different biological reasons, it's basically once you're over the age of 35, it's very difficult to learn. 45, <laughs> you're downright impossible. And by the time you get to 50, yeah. 53, when I started, it's just totally crazy. Um, and people just laughed at you, lit me. <laughs> but yeah. so that's the, the the book tells the story of that experiment. The experiment was a, was a radical success. Um, it and, uh, and and so that's what the that's what the book is. Uh, so it's applied peak performance and a look at at the sort of the new field of peak performance aging. And the last thing I'm going to say on this because I know there's probably like so I'm a large chunk of your listeners who went peak performance aging. What the what, what the fuck does that have anything to do with me, right? Yeah. And the thing I want to mention before you sort of dismiss all this out of hand is one, the peak performance tools work the same at any age. Two, and this is really key. One of the so it's very clear aging's a fact of life. It's a process. Old is a mindset, and old is a mindset that starts to set up in our twenties. And peak performance aging actually. Um, the mental side of it, the physical, physical side to it, but the mental side of it also starts in our 20s. There's stuff you want to do in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s um, that really will determine the success at the tail end of your life. So that's just the, the quick caveat. Like yeah. before I, I lose a third of the people because they're just like, this doesn't apply to me. No, no, <laughs> it really actually does. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I appreciate you sharing that. And I know when it comes to, Peak performance overall, and that's been something that myself, I've been super interested in the past year. I, I ran my my first marathon last December and just getting into that mentality to, to push beyond the, my limits that I, I thought were possible. Um, it, it's been quite the journey. And I would love to ask you, where did this initial desire and passion come from of learning about peak performance in your early 20s? Like, where did this journey begin for you? And, and what did that early process of wanting to get on this path look like in your life? So since so many listeners are entrepreneurs, I'll just start with the, the entrepreneurial side of the story. You've got to understand that a lot of what happens is a solution to, I'm a writer, 
I know I wanted to be a writer since I was a little kid. So how the hell do you get paid to be a writer? Right? Like that's the puzzle I'm trying to solve. I start my career in journalism and the secret to being successful as journalism is to massively exploit your curiosity. Anything you're curious about becomes articles. And um, I was very, very curious about two things. One, the obvious neuroscience and, and performance-based neuroscience. And the reason was in the 1990s when I started my career, neuroscience went from this transition of like, it was used to be about like, what does this cluster of neurons, the temporal <laughs> cortex do, and right? And suddenly it was yeah. about, no, no, what are our emotions? And where do they come from? What is consciousness? And what are altered states of consciousness? And like those suddenly became topics we could talk about. And I was fascinated. I was super curious. And I liked neuroscience because I'm interested in human behavior. And I tried psychology and it's squishy and it's subjective and it's individual. And what works for me is probably not going to work for you. But neuroscience is mechanism shaped by evolution and shared by all humans. And it's basic, it's biological. So if we want something that's reliable and repeatable, it's going to work for you, for me, for everybody. You want neuroscience. So that was part A and part B is totally the other side of, of, of the field is I was obsessed with action sports. And if you know, and so I was live writing about now action sports in the early 1990s it's not mainstream there's no x games there's no gravity games it's this like deep punk rock subculture <laughs> right and it's all this stuff is just getting started but if you know anything about uh action sports in the 90s and all of them surfing skiing rock climbing snowboarding the like yep. it's often referred to as the era of impossible or more impossible feats stuff that had never been done and we thought never would be done got done in fact what was wild about it is you would watch people iterate on the impossible. Like on Monday, <laughs> something that's never been done in history gets done. And then like on Thursday, somebody does it and, <laughs> and like, you know, innovates a little more and next week the function, yeah. it's wild. You don't know what's going on. And so the first question was, you know, just simple, like what the fuck, what the, what the <laughs> hell is going on, right? Like, yeah. how is this possible? I also say it's a really different thing when you see like an athlete do the impossible on a big screen or on your screen, when you're living in the community, you go drinking with your friends on Friday night, and then you go into the mountains on Saturday morning, and everybody's hung over and tired, whatever, and then your friend does something for all of recorded history that's never been done. That's a very <laughs> different experience, right? Absolutely. On, on top of it, especially if you go back into the 90s, what we knew about peak performance could be summed up as it's, it's nature or nurture. It's genetics or it's early childhood experience. And yet, like, on an early childhood experience tip and, and the other factors that were supposed to play a role, none of them were present. Like everybody I knew, they didn't come from like great childhoods. They came from broken homes and really bad childhoods. They had very little education. They didn't have any money. There was a ton of risk taking in these communities and a ton of substance abuse. And normally if you put those things together in a community, people die young and they go to jail. What they okay. don't do is reinvent what's possible for the human species on a regular basis. And that's what was going on. So that was like, as for a guy wow. like me, who was curious about peak performance in general anyways, and the neurobiology of it, this was like the greatest puzzle of a lifetime right in front of me. So that's really where it started. It wow. built from there, went a bunch of different directions, got strengthened a bunch of different ways. In the beginning, I was covering it as a journalist, and then I was covering it as a, a book writer. And then I was covering it as a neuroscientist and somebody, you know, leading the research and doing the research. So it's changed yeah. how I've probed the question too. Wow. That, that, that's actually so cool. I can't imagine like early nineties, extreme sports, you know, one of my buddies, Dingo, he was, he was involved in the X games early on, like, be, like being the, the guy that introduces people and just hearing stories from him and, and even from you, like, that was such a unique era, right? Like seeing... it was the wild. It was the it was <laughs> truly the wild, wild west at a at, at a level. Um, it's really hard to explain because you essentially took the most quote unquote extreme people on the planet and you yeah. put them together into these incubators. There were only like five or six towns, right? You had Squaw Valley, California, Olympic Valley, California, yeah. and Whistler, and Jackson Hole, and Chamonix, and a couple places, a couple of surf places. So it was a very small tight pretty insane community <laughs> that's insane no i mean I, I laugh but like there's a so if you're of the generate generation of action sport athletes that i am 
Um, I, and this just happened to me. I sat down with, with one of the early free skiers in, in Canada. I haven't seen him for 30 years. And we sat down to dinner and he looked at me and he said, you know, neither of us were supposed to be 30. And I just started laughing because none of us were supposed to be 30. Right. Oh. That was, that was, that was the other thing about it is it was a deep punk rock subculture. Yeah. No, that's, that's insane. Like in, I got to ask, you know, when it comes to that transition initially out of extreme sports, what was that like for so it, you? It, it was easy. Uh, easy is the wrong word. So two things facilitated it. One was I was not a professional athlete. I was chasing them around all the time and I kept breaking bones. So there's a certain point where you're just like, I now didn't keep me from action sports, but it kept me from like, I just, you can't try to keep up with pros if you're not a pro. You have to, right? Yeah. So that was part of it. The other part of it was as a creative, as a writer, right? And um, and a lot of my friends were filmmakers or artists, that sort of things. I started wondering about doing the impossible in creative activities. And that led me right into, what does it take to do the impossible in business and entrepreneurship? And those are, and so if you look at my book, so for example, Tomorrowland is, a book about those maverick innovators who took sci-fi ideas from the 20th century and turned them into science fact technologies. The people who dreamed up AI and bionics and robotics and all that yeah. stuff at the front end when it was literally doing the impossible of dreaming up the future. Or I did Bold it's, it's a look at upstart entrepreneurs, Larry Page, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Richard Branson, um, people who built world changing businesses in record time. And often if you, you know, get under the hood of all those stories, they're in, verticals where nobody even thought you could start a company, let alone build a world changing company. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so forth. Abundance was a look at small teams and individuals going after like global impossible challenges, water, scarcity, uh, poverty, energy shortages, that sort of stuff. So impossible global challenges. And what's interesting about it, in, and this is what was so cool for me, and this is where sort of flow comes back into it is when you talk to the action sport athletes, of course, they, I mean, we didn't use the term flow back then. Nobody really had that language exactly, <laughs> but it would all describe like when I'm at my best, I'm in this altered state where every decision, every action yeah. flows seamlessly, perfectly, you know, myself is gone. Time is strange. And then you go talk to, you know, Richard Branson about how he built version and he'll say, yeah, you know, it's because of flow and two hours in flow. There's nothing I can't do. It didn't matter where I went every domain because flow is how humans do we're hardwired for it, right it's it's yeah. in all of us so anytime you see the impossible become possible anytime you see peak human performance you're seeing the state of consciousness and that was sort of you know that was the most exciting thing in the world is early on when we were i remember trying to map the early work on flow and the neurobiology of flow was done on Tibetan monks and, and Buddhists and nuns mm. and people in deep meditation. And it wasn't exactly flow, but they had this experience in meditation of oneness with everything, right? People would meditate. They feel one with the universe. Yep. And I was talking to surfers about what was going on, Laird Hamilton and, the, and they're talking about, yeah. dude, I'm, I'm one with the wave. And, you know, and it's, and I, so my mentor is a guy named Andy Newberg uh, and he was the neuroscientist who first put monks into scanners to try to figure out what the hell's going on in the brain when you're one with everything. And I remember my whole career started because I called him up. I read about his work. I called him up and said, look, man, I'm looking at this experience in, in athletes and surfers and they're talking about becoming one with, waves do you think that's what's going on <laughs> same thing's going on with your monks and andy is great and um super curious and just an amazing man and he said i don't know but let's figure it out together and that was sort of how my career really got started um that is incredible it, it, it's so unique when you so i'm actually reading richard branson's biography right now and like the things you're saying like from the business side but also i think what's been super um just I, I've noticed such a big difference over the past year from the physical component of again, like running a marathon. I like seeing reading Richard Branch's book, he he went on this journey of hot air ballooning, you know, across the Pacific. And he as you know very well, like he did the impossible. He broke this record, he took a hot air balloon across the Pacific. And seeing not only what he did there, but also from a business perspective and, and taking on new industries, there's there's so many examples of him doing the impossible and even to bring it back to like a, a former guest on the podcast uh, you may know him james lawrence he's known as the iron cowboy 
and he did 101 Ironmans within 101 days. And I interviewed him before I did my marathon. And, you know, we were just discussing like pushing the limit and just what I was able to take through that conversation and then through the experience of running my first marathon, which is completely different than 101 Ironmans. Um, it just, it allowed me to really understand my mind from a physical like what I'm physically capable of, right? Versus in a business setting, which is completely different from a, you know, how I think about optimization. I would love for you to bridge that gap, right? There's a lot of business owners that listen to this show. How do you reach flow from a business perspective, but also in a physical perspective and how are they interchangeable and how can you yeah. bridge that gap for, for people like myself that are, you know, ambitious in business, but also looking to do those extreme adventures and, and push the limit physically. Perfect. Perfect. Great question. Um, so flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. There are uh, 26 that are that have been identified. There are probably way more, but that's what we found so far. First thing to know, flow comes in two varieties, individual flow, me in a flow state, you in a flow state, and then there's group flow, right? It's a shared collective flow state, me and you together which is two people talking, right? Great conversation, hours go by, you don't notice. That's known as interpersonal flow. You can have group flow or team flow, fourth quarter comeback in football or basketball. That's what you're looking at. Great performance on stage at a concert, theater performance. That's what you're looking at. Um, and then there's communitas flow at scale. You go to a rock concert, everybody merges with the band, each other all <laughs> clapping in sync and one with the crowd, that's communitas, right? Uh, so there are, 12 triggers for individual flow, 14 triggers for group flow. There's, as I said, way more, but that's where we are right now. The thing to know is this, flow follows focus. The state only shows up when all of our attention is in the right here, right now. So that's what all the triggers do. They do it a bunch of different ways, neurobiologically, what's going on under the hood. But what they're all doing is they're driving attention into the present moment. So let's talk about your experience you had running. And one of the things that's so cool about running, and then let's talk about how to apply it to business. So one of the things that you learned about running and training, and you just talked about it is you were pushing yourself a little bit farther every day, a little bit farther, a little bit farther, a little bit farther, right? So the golden rule of flow, the most important of the flows triggers is what's known as the challenge skills balance. Flow follows focus. We pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of that task slightly exceeds our skill set. So you want to mm. stretch, but not snap. If I were to put it emotionally, I'd say sort of near the midpoint between boredom and anxiety. Boredom, there's not enough stimulation here. I don't give a shit. I'm not paying attention. Anxiety, well, way too much, right? <laughs> I'm paying too much attention. I can't stop paying attention. In between is this sweet spot. It's what uh, psychologists and, and flow, flow scientists talk about as the flow channel. If you happen to speak physiology and you're listening to this, it's what's known as the Erks dobson curve. So depending on, on which language you, you learn that it's different, but... So let me talk about how this goes right and wrong in entrepreneurship. Okay. So Please. what's, and, and more than anything else. So one, let's just talk about actions. Let's start with action sports. Years ago, the godfather of flow psychology, a guy named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, um, tried to figure out with a Google mathematician, the distance between the challenge skills balance, like what's the ratio. And it, this is not a real number. This is made up science, a metaphor, but it's useful. And that's what we're going to talk about it. He, they came up with a 5% difference, meaning we pay the most attention to the task at hand, gives us the greatest chance of getting into flow when the task is about 5% harder than our skills. So you're always stretching to the edge of your skill set. Now in athletics, we sort of know where that is. It's a little easier to find in entrepreneurship. It can be tricky and business can be tricky. Yeah. So this, and it's tricky in two, two reasons. So if you are shy, if you are meek, if you are timid, uh, if you are risk adverse, it is tricky because it is just outside your comfort zone. So you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. You have to get really good at that for most entrepreneurs, for most hard charging type A entrepreneurial types, the problem is they love huge challenges. It wakes them up. They will take yeah. on a challenge that's 50, 60% greater than their skills <laughs> simply because like, it keeps them awake. And that is both good and bad. So the research into human motivation shows that these high hard goals are great. They give us an 11, 25% boost in motivation. So you want to set them. 
It's just that you have to chunk down what's directly in front of you, what you're focused on today. So it's that sweet spot, right? So it's about 5% sweet spot. Now, I'll give you two uh, examples in business where we see this being applied. A uh, simple example, I'm a writer. I want to, my, my, my most important task every day is going to be to advance whatever book I'm writing. Now, when I start a book, I write 500, page, 500 words a day. Why is that? Because I can write yeah. 350 my eyes closed. But at around 350, I got to transition from one idea to the next. And transitions mm -hmm. are hard. So 500 words, I'm stretching. It's going to take a, a while, but I'm not snapping. In the middle of the book, I sort of know where I'm going. So it's about 750 words. End of the book, I really know where I'm going. It's about 1,000. <laughs> the point here is you got to sort of find your edge. So that's an example of, of what it looks like in business myself. What does it look like at a corporate level? The classic example is Toyota, actually. So in the 80s, Toyota is just another car company. It becomes the globally dominant car company in the 90s. Why? New management philosophy, Kaizen. Kaizen uh, is two flow triggers combined into a single idea. It's the idea of continual improvement. It, so autonomy is a flow trigger. When we are driving the bus, we care about more where it's going, right? So we pay more yeah. attention to the stuff we're doing. So Kaizen basically says, you work at Toyota, let's say you work on the assembly line, doing a job that has, you know, what it, we feel is totally mechanical. You put hubcaps on tires. Ownership comes to you and says, no, 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 that's, that's a part of your job. That's what you do. But your <laughs> real job is to make the entire line better, to make the whole hubcap on tire process better. It continuously improved Toyota as a whole and our car. And suddenly employees went from, I'm doing mechanical labor to, holy fuck, I can improve Toyota. I got autonomy. The challenge just went up. I know. And the result was tons of flow. Flow underpins peak performance. The result was global car company dominance. So one trigger, wow. bunch of different examples. No, that that is... Very cool to hear. And, and it gets me thinking, you know, from a, the different life cycles of a business, are there specific, you know, flow triggers that come into play with a, you know, a, a team of five people to 50 to 500 to 5,000? And what are your thoughts on, you know, the growth of a company and how you can tap into different flow triggers and, you know, what's most optimal? So that is interesting for a bunch of reasons. The first is nobody's ever asked me that question, which is, Okay. kind of miraculous um, <laughs> and wild. And um, let me just be truthful. I don't have a freaking clue. I don't think anybody's ever looked. And, um, but, 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 let me pause. So let me, let me go through a bunch of flow triggers. So one yeah. of the ways that flow triggers work is they drive dopamine into the brain. Dopamine, we all know what dopamine is. We've heard about it. It's a reward chemical. It's a focusing chemical that underpins excitement, right? Yep. Think about when your phone dings, something you can't stop paying attention to your phone. <laughs> That's what dopamine does to focus. It makes us excited and it focuses us on the thing in front of us, right? The task. Yep. So a bunch of the triggers drive dopamine. Novelty. Novel environments drive dopamine. Complexity, unpredictability, risk. Physical risk, emotional risk, social risk, intellectual risk, creative risk, um, all of those things. And pattern recognition also drives dopamine when we link ideas together in a new way. So what I have just explained is that startups freaking packed with flow triggers. They're packed, <laughs> which is why if you've ever been involved in a startup getting to launch, it's yep. incredibly high flow. Right. It's almost like a group flow experience after group flow experience after group flow experience after group flow experience. And then what happens at launch? The flow all goes away because the jobs <laughs> get routinized. Right. Yep. And so I, uh, I joke. So Peter Diamandis, who I've written a number of books with and who's a very, very close friend of mine and who I've known forever. You know, I've been involved in 22 startups. Peter's been involved in oh my 28 goodness. or 29. Um, and we laugh because this is total flow junkie behavior. Flow junkies like, you know, we want to get the company off the, off the ground. And then like interest yeah. waivers, you want to get to the next thing. Right. So that is a, that's actually a problem with companies, right? You have to, you have to steer around that kind of behavior and you have to know it's coming and, and sort of prepare for it. Um, and, uh, it's not that the triggers shift so much, but the ways we utilize them shift. And I'll give you a simple example. 
all the triggers I named those dopamine triggers that show up the front end, we trade them for a much subtler, more complicated set of group flow triggers to mat, to get that same bunch of group flow. Now, suddenly things like close listening, um, where, you know, I'm listening to you. I'm not trying to finish your sentences or anticipate what I'm going to say next or think about that mean thing you just said, right? I'm fully mm -hmm. with you in the present moment, right? Uh, yes, and so is in a group flow trigger. So in yes, and games, right? Uh, I never say no. So, right, if it's, it comes out of improv, first rule of improv yeah. is, you know, you come up to me and you're like, Stephen, there's a blue elephant in the bathroom. If I say, well, shut up. No, there's not. It's not funny. It goes nowhere. But I'm like, oh, my God, there is. I hope he's not using all the toilet paper. Now we've got a skit, right? It's rolling. It's moving yeah. somewhere. That's a yes and game. So what it basically tells us is that conversations need to be additive and not argumentative. And that doesn't – so one thing for entrepreneurs who hear this, this mm -hmm. doesn't mean – so the problem with brainstorming sessions where nobody has critical feedback is group think. You get lukewarm, mediocre ideas. So yep. when I say yes and, I can say to you, so let's say you just pitched me something and I, most of it I don't like. What I, how I do it is I'd be like, Casey, you know, 90% of what you just said, I'm, I'm not down with, I don't agree with, but you had that little nugget about the blah, blah, blah. And let's, and I'm, and there we're off and running. So, right, you can be mm. critical, but yep. you're still playing yes and games. So what happens as companies start to shift is the triggers they're leaning on are going to start to shift a little bit. Um, and that, uh, that's a little bit different. Um, yeah. There's, so that, that's, I have, there's, there's probably a better, there's probably bigger, better answers to your question too, but nobody's actually asked me the life cycle of company <laughs> flow trigger question before, but I, you know, I'm taking That's... it back to my team because it's a cool <laughs> idea. I'm glad. I, I was just curious about it. No, the, 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 that idea of flow triggers in the company life cycle, I just came to me and I, I was curious and for you for context. I, I had a startup that I, that I recently got acquired back in September of last year. We launched it. It was 12 months from start to acquisition. And I just reflecting on that journey the past six months post acquisition has like leading up to this conversation and just understanding flow and where I felt the most creative and the most output versus stagnant. And in that, you know, in that mindset of like, Oh, how do we get ahead? How do we keep the ball rolling? I just noted like that in that company from like, you know, just a co-founder to 10 employees, it was such a, there were so many different phases, right? And it was only 12 month journey from start to exit, but just taking that concept and, I was just curious about that question, and, and I definitely appreciate you. Let me say, yeah, let um, me say one other thing that, that I'd be derelict in not saying. So the other thing to know um, is how trainable this stuff really is. So the, oh, I told you a little about the collective training people in 130 yeah. countries and whatever. Our tra average training is about eight weeks long. It's digital, uh, and you go through a PhD psychologist as a coach. Not easy is my point. Um, there's homework. It, you you got to lean in. But we measure everything pre and post. On the back end of an eight-week training, we see a 70 to 80% boost in flow. Wow. Um, and that's pretty standard. Um, uh, it goes up and down. The last, we, we data capture roughly every three months. Um, and I think in the last batch, it was 71.25% increase in flow um, on wow. average. Um, so uh, my point is this stuff is very, very trainable. We can get a lot better at this stuff. So when we talk about peak performance being available to anybody, we talk about flow underpinning peak performance. We talk about all aspects, you know, improving. This is the thing we can all tap into. Um, you must have had a crazy uh, flow journey <laughs> one year to exit. That's very fast. And fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And no, I appreciate that. It's definitely, it, and quite frankly, like coming out of that, like the past six months, I've been fully immersed in this whole idea of like optimization and got the cold plunge. I got my sleep data. Like I'm really just trying to optimize. Like when do I feel best? And it's led me to now having all these different discussions with friends and people that take this stuff seriously. And I'd love to ask you when it comes to your personal ability to get into flow, how has that changed for you over the years in a business setting, in a, in an extreme sports setting? And what is your, um, you know, just, most optimized state and how do you achieve that? Oh, well, that's a little more complicated of an, of an answer. So what I will tell you is the state has become, and a lot of this is, is, is the result of science, right? We understand it better. So, but it's, it's gone from 
something that was sort of really mystical, hard to produce, something that's reliable and repeatable, something that I can sort of trust. I know how to utilize it. I, I, I know how to get there. It's not a hundred percent. Um, but, uh, and usually if I don't, I don't end up in flow when I'm trying, I, I can put my finger on the reason, like which small constellation, but so that's, I, that's changed a lot over the years. Um, and my protocols, they're based on sort of biology. So the same, a lot of the stuff I do is the same stuff we're, we're training people to do. Cause it's, it's, it's built on the biology of it. Um, I can go into a ton of, ton of detail. <laughs> where do you, where do you want me to, where do you want me to go? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, what I mean, a lot of this is obviously what's covered in sort of in our country is like, what does it yeah, look like course. on a day-to-day -day basis kind of thing. But point, give me a little, a little bit yeah, so, firmer like, question. And I here's, here's some context. So like, for example, as, as someone that I respect so much as an author, you've written 14 books. Um, someone that I also love as an author that I've had in the podcast many times is Robert Greene. And we were talking about, um, you know, 48 Laws of Power and all these different books and how he's achieved his flow. And he kind of gave me some behind the scenes in his, when I went to his house to do the podcast of like how he writes his books and where he feels the most. And I don't know, he probably didn't say the word flow, but like when he feels the most optimized and when he can get the most done, I would love to know just in the context of the question, like where, how do you feel okay. in flow the yeah. most in the context so, of let's say writing a book okay. or in a productive so setting? I business? get up. I'm so, and I'll just, I'll give you the peak performance tip and then I'll tell you how I do it. So one, you want to start your day or your work session with your hardest for task first, right? And you want to align your work session with your circadian rhythms. I'm an extreme lark. I like to get up really early. I get up at 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning. My wife, wow. I'm married to a night owl. She doesn't really start. Her brain doesn't really turn on until 4 or 5 in the evening, right? Most people are actually, their brain sort of peaks at 9 a.m., which is why work starts then, right? But I get up every day at 4 a.m. When you wake up, your brain is producing alpha waves. Um, creativity has an alpha wave signature. So what I try to do is go from bed to my desk. Um, my office is not in my house. It's literally next door to my house. So um, literally, I try to go from like bed to desk in under five minutes. It's like bed to desk with coffee brewing in under five minutes and um, immediately into the writing. And complete concentration is a flow trigger. So this means I've prepared my space. That means distraction management. There's uh, no email, no text, no messages, right? All that stuff's turned off. My phone's off. Um, I actually keep the lights in my office off and I leave uh, I write in Microsoft Word, which has focus view, and I literally, I just mm. look at the words. So I will, wow. the night before, I prepare my office, and I've turned everything off, and all I'm looking at is the words. The coffee is ready. I just have to flip the switch, and, nope. you know, I'm writing. Wow. And so I will work, I will write, depending, 4 to 7 or 4 to 8 a.m. Wow. Um, it, and, it, and, and it depends. And... Uh, that is immediately followed by hiking my dogs to the back country. There are reasons, there are flow reasons for this as well. Flow states are um, not a binary. You're not in the zone or out of the zone. It's actually a four stage cycle. There's a struggle phase on the front end and a relaxing, a release phase. You take your mind off the problem in the flow state itself and then a recovery state on the back end because flows biologically expensive produce. So if I, the writing goes well and I got into flow, right? I want a recovery mm -hmm. activity on the back end and a walk in nature is actually a really good recovery activity. If I'm in struggle and uh, super, super frustrated, I need to take my mind off the problem and low grade physical activity works really well for that. So thus a walk in nature. Now I do a bunch of other things on that walk that we're not gonna have time to go into yeah. um, depending on, on, on sort of where I am or what I am, but, um, People always ask, like, uh, you know, how is it that, you know, how did you, you write so many books? And, and the reason is, you know, I write, uh, there are some days I'll write all day. And uh, I have two big editing sessions where I work with my editor 
every week um, on top of it. But I will write four hours a day, seven days a week, no matter what. Wow. That is just hearing that it's, it's so great. I, I'm someone that just hearing the, the context and, and understanding your flow is very, very unique. And, and I'm sure the listeners really appreciated that. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, last question before we start to wrap up here, Stephen, as you said at the beginning of this podcast, which I know people heard is you and the people that you work with have trained tens of thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands all over the world, 130 plus countries. If you were to give a business owner or someone that was really looking to just start that journey to optimize and get into flow, what would, what would you tell them is a great first step? And of course, you know, I want to make sure they, they know where to go to learn more because it's so yeah, I mean, it, okay, so, so much work it, out there. I'll give you two, I'm going to give you two answers. Um, I'm going to give you one that's going to sound self-serving, but I think it's probably the best first step for your listeners. If you're curious, you can literally, I apologize for the cheesy URL, getmoreflow.com. Um, I love it. If you go to getmoreflow.com, you can literally sign up for a free hour-long coaching call with somebody on my team. They'll tell you about our programs, but mostly they're just going to listen to your life and tell you sort of how to sort of use flow and use peak performance to fine tune it, tell you what's available. That is a really great place to start. Um, if you want to go, you know, a little deeper, uh, Our Country is the new book, my older book, The Art of Impossible, both are sort of flow Bibles. The Art of Impossible is more science. NAR has more applied peak performance and, you know, that you can read them together separately, whatever. Um, and those, that's my super self-serving answer. Oh, that's great. Now let me give you a, a totally different answer. Okay. Um, and you can sort of take your pick though. The truth of the matter is uh, it doesn't, you can walk through door number one or door number two, because you can end up at the same place one way or another. So <laughs> I have to tell you a couple more things about flow and then I'm going to give you my, uh, give you the, the thing to do. So the first thing you need to know about flow is that, um, flow is a sort of a focusing skill. So the more flow you get, the more flow you get. So if I go skiing on Sunday and get into a flow state, I'm going to have an easier time Tuesday at work getting into flow. The other things I need to tell you are that, um, Inflow, some of the things that gets heightened, overall, huge impact on mood, happiness, well-being, overall life satisfaction, right? Um, psychologists now define the upper two tiers of happiness with flow baked into the discovery. But so the heightened mood you get in the flow state, which is a huge boost in mood, uh, will outlast the flow state by a day sometimes too. Creativity spikes in flow. Creativity and innovation spikes in flow, which is why this is so important in entrepreneurship. And it's it's a huge number. It's 400 to 700%, depending on how we're measuring. Wow. Um, and a lot of different people, like we've done that in our lab, they did it at Harvard, they did it at the University of Sydney. It's like pretty well established that you get this big spike. And that, uh, they figured this out at Harvard, will outlast the flow state by a day, maybe two. So this huge spike in creativity and huge spike in mood will outlast the flow state. Plus it's this focusing skill. And the third thing you need to know is when we move into flow, so there's a, a global release of nitric oxide. It pushes stress hormones out of our system and it resets the nervous system back to zero. So in our over anxious world where we're all hypervigilant all the time, that hypervigilance costs us. It's actually that those stress hormones really, they're taxing on the body, but they block learning, they block creativity, they block performance. There's problems with this. So flow resets the nervous system. So all of these are performance benefits that uh, accrue no matter how you get flow, right? And yep. so what I always tell people is the place to start is with what's known as your primary flow activity. This is whatever you've done since you were a little kid, which <laughs> most likely to drop you into flow. For me, it is skiing. For my wife, it is hiking the dogs to the back. For my best friend, it's playing the guitar. My other best friend, it's gardening, drawing, coding, dancing, yeah. samba, dancing, salsa, take on and on and on, right? Rapping. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, the list is really endless, but we tell people double down on your primary flow activity. And this, so the thing is, and this is maybe the thought I'll leave everybody with is even in your twenties, right? And I'm sure you're doing this in your head a little bit. So I remember I said earlier that old is a mindset. Right. 
and yep. sets up early. One of the things that starts happening in your 20s is you start, A, you hear the voice in your head going, are you too old for this shit? And you start making, right, you start putting aside childish things. You, the skateboard goes away. The surfboard goes away. I'm going to focus on my business. I'm going to focus on my relationship, whatever, right? Those are the things we start doing. And from a performance perspective, it's a disaster. It's actually a really bad idea. The more flow you get, the more flow you get. You want to keep those things integrated in your life as much as possible. So um, double down on your primary flow activity. Go to getmoreflow.com. Sign up for, for that free informational interview. Read a bunch of books, you know. Um, I love and, it. Uh, but uh, that's, those are the places I would, I would start. And um, I also think... You know, as you learn from running the marathon, like when you get into flow and use flow to expand what's possible for yourself, it unlocks the next possibility space. And then yep. you get flow, get into flow and, and expand. And it, uh, that's how, right, this is sort of the path to impossible. And it's, it starts with like small I impossible, the shit that we think is impossible for ourselves, not capital I impossible, yeah. that which has never been done. It's small I. I, st I was a writer. I came out of Cleveland. I didn't know any writers. I didn't know how you became a writer. It was like one day I woke up and said, today I'm going to be an elf. You know what I mean? Like it was a, it was a small eye impossible. Yeah. Um, statistically, there's really poor odds of success and there's no clear path between point A and where I want to go, point B. Um, that's a small eye impossible. And by like small eye impossible after small eye impossible after small eye impossible, you sort of sometimes end up accomplishing capital I impossible along the way. I absolutely love that, Stephen. And I learned so much today and I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show and outside of the website that you mentioned, where's the best place where people can follow you on social and just stay connected with you overall. Yeah, you can, uh, Stephen com is, uh, is me. You can, you can find me on the Instagram. If I could remember what my goddamn Instagram name is. Um, it's so <laughs> funny. It's at Stephen Kotler can't believe I yep. just blanked out what Instagram <laughs> was. That was really funny. I felt really dumb for I love a second. It. Um, uh, yeah. At Stephen Collar on Instagram, stephencollar.com, flowresearchcollective.com, getmoreflow.com. I think that's Perfect. all of it. Or, or awesome. Or enough of it. You can find awesome. me Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. 